Hello, everybody. I am Dr. Kevin Connors, and we are talking about your genetic variants, your genetic defects. Um, and uh, today's this presentation is going to be on energy production. I call it finding the hidden causes of disease because many times this is like a hidden piece, a gem that you discover that can be your final stone that you unturn that can be, oh, that's why. And we talk about your mitochondrial genes, what we're going to talk about in this presentation. There's a lot of, oh, that's why going on here. Because when you deal with chronic fatigue patients, it's always been difficult to deal with them. Until you learn genetics and you start to get those aha moments. So it can really be a light bulb moment. That's why I put a light bulb on this slide. Because many times when you look at your genetics, it can be a light bulb moment. But if you watched the, the, uh, the gut one, the first one I did, if you watch that video, you will hear me hounding the fact that it's not solely your genetics. Environment plays a huge, if not trumps completely, the genetics. So um, it is really the environment plus the genetics. And it is the environment that tipped the person over into really seeing their genetic defects. Because you've had these genetic defects since you were born. Okay, and you just got your symptoms when you turned 30 or when you had your last baby or when you, you know, whatever it was, it was the environment that tipped you over. So now you start to see really your genetic flaws and now supporting these genetic flaws can really help you get tipped back over and feeling much better. So this, uh, these presentations presuppose that you have already done or you're going to do your 23andMe profile. That's the lab. You have to pay for that through 23andMe. That's completely out of my hands. Go to 23andMe.com and order the complete $199 profile. At least that's what the price it is as I'm taping this. Uh, don't get the cheaper one. Get the full one. And then I need your username and password in order to put it into our software to do this application. So as you look at these slides, you can see that. So if you're looking at these slides and you haven't purchased our um, interpretation of your 23andMe and had me put it into the software, my software, and then have me give you a copy of that SNP, you know, genetic defect profile, all this will look really weird to you when I start showing you the pictures of your genetics because you don't see it on your 23andMe because they don't give you that detail because they're not a clinic. They're not a clinician, so they can't legally give you a bunch of interpretation. So they have to be careful, FDA-wise, to not do that. So if you're trying to skip by and oh, I'm just going to watch this guy's videos, if I don't see this on my 23andMe, how come I don't see it? Because you're not getting the same SNP report. I'm not saying you have to buy my thing, but go to somebody who knows how to interpret this for you then so you can get this detail. So in this presentation, we're talking about energy production. And we're going to get some detail uh, I'm not trying to um, uh, uncover your flaws in, in uh, human biology from high school, but we're, we have to get into this in a little bit of depth because it helps you understand that. So when we're talking about energy production, we're talking about glycolysis and the Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation, the, your fatty acid cycle. That's what produces ATP. That's really what energy is. And all your cells need ATP in order to do what it needs to do. In order for muscles to contract, it requires ATP. In order for all the cells to do what they need to do, they need ATP. So all your cells have mitochondria in the cells in order to produce ATP. It's not produced in a certain spot and then distributed through the bloodstream. It's produced in the cell in order for that cellular function to take place. And in the mitochondria, these little organelles inside the cells, um, that's what's happening. This, the glycolysis, citric acid cycle, or the Krebs cycle, oxidative phosphorylation, the fatty acid cycle, in order to spit out ATP so that cell could do what it's supposed to do. So if you have inadequate production of ATP for multiple reasons, and we're going to talk about some of those in this presentation, then that cell isn't going to do what it's supposed to do, 
and you're going to have symptoms based upon that cell's inability to do that. So if my heart cells, which have an enormous number of, of mitochondria compared to other cells, because your heart cells have to contract every second, um, if they're not able to produce the ATP or an inadequate amount of ATP, you're going to have more heart, you're going to have more fatigue because your heart is not going to pump at the same strength as it should be. And you're going to have more fatigue completely based upon that. I mean, physical fatigue. You're going to have muscle fatigue. If your muscle cells can't produce ATP, they're going to fatigue out quickly. Uh, that's really what getting in shape is. Getting in shape is technically your muscle cells ability to convert pyruvate to acetyl coenzyme A to get into the Krebs cycle to produce ATP. The rate at which pyruvate converts to acetyl coenzyme A to get into the Krebs cycle to produce ATP is what getting in shape is. So if I haven't run for a while and I'm going to start running, it's like, oh my gosh, my legs are so sore. It's because pyruvate is converting to lactic acid. And that's what the pain and the soreness of my muscle is because that rate limiting step of conversion from pyruvate to acetyl coenzyme A is very slow. So as I keep working it, as I keep exercising, as long as I have decent genes and as long as I'm feeding my genes very well with the substrates needed for that conversion factor, then but that rate of conversion for pyruvate to acetyl coenzyme A is quicker and I am getting, quote, unquote, in shape. So understand that? Good. We'll have a quiz on it at the end. So that's what we're talking about. There are genetic um, components in each one of these steps. So you look at this picture of the Krebs cycle. Um, I talked about the upper piece there, pyruvate to acetyl coenzyme A, quite briefly there. But there's a whole bunch of different steps. Um, and each one of these conversion steps are dependent upon enzymes. Enzymes are made by genes. So that's what we're looking at. Do you have a lot of defects on the genes that make these enzymes? Well, guess what? It's going to slow that conversion. And you can see it on tests like their genetic test, your 23andMe. I have the defect. And you can see it on tests like an organic acid test. An organic acid test actually tests the substrates. And wow, I have a lot of this substrate, but very little of the next step substrate. And I have a gene defect. What's supposed to convert substrate A into substrate B? Well, no wonder. Well, if I support that step, then I'll convert A to B more quickly, and I will produce more ATP. It's not really rocket science, people. It's just looking at these conversion steps and looking at what A makes, turns into B, B turns into C, C turns into D. Are there limiting factors of A turning into B and B turning into C? Yes, there are. Well, let's find out what they are. Let's look at them. Okay, well, here's a limiting factor right here. We have a defect here. We have a decrease in subs. We have a decrease in, um, in nutrients that that uh, help move that step. So let's let's play with that, and you can make the world of difference in a person's life. <sighs> a lot to say, huh? So I'm trying to make this as uncomplicated as possible. Um, but I know there's a lot of steps. And if you don't have a science background and a science mind, you might go, I don't get this. Listen to it a few times. You know, uh, truthfully, honestly, you don't have to get this. You don't have to become a functional medicine person. You don't have to become a geneticist. Just um, take my recommendations then. But I make these videos because I believe the more informed you are, the better decisions you can make, and it helps you understand the recommendations I'm making. I don't want to be the kind of doctor where a person comes to me and I say, here, just take this prescription, and give you the prescription, and you go out, and, and uh, maybe that's not the best thing for you. Plus, I don't I cannot possibly communicate with every one of you. I can't. It's impossible. You can't all come to my clinic. I can't run all these different tests on you. And I understand there's a lot of information here. And your current local doctor might not understand this piece. That's okay. But so if I can fill in the gaps there, then that's a beautiful thing. And 
and you can take my recommendations that I'm going to give you at the end, and you can then take it back to your doctor, and he can go over, or she can go over that, or test you on those things, or whatever, and you can make more or better informed decisions. That's the whole purpose of this, okay? That's why it's not expensive either. So I spend a lot of time teaching and making these videos, so um, please don't call our office and be mad because you tried something and it didn't work. You know, I didn't do an exam on you. Okay, please don't do that. That's very frustrating for me and my staff when I feel like we give a lot here. You know, download all my books for free. Download these videos. Utilize the information I give you, but I can't possibly be everything to everybody. So when we look at energy production, there's three phases. There's glycolysis, there's the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle, and there's the electron transport change, chain, oxidative phosphorylation. So that's cell respiration. That's how cells make energy. That's how cells work. Um, so that's, we're going to kind of go through those. We're going to go through them quite quickly. So I'm not going to try to give you a high school or uh, college biology degree here. So you need NADH and FADH um, in order for uh, oxidation to occur, in order for, you need an oxidizing agent in order for um, that's for oxidation to occur. You need a reducing agent in order for a reduction to occur. And understand, we take, oh, we need to, we don't need oxidation in our body because um, that's bad because that can cause cancer. So we need to take a whole bunch of antioxidants. So chemical exposure causes oxidation, and that's not good. That causes cell death. So we need to take a whole bunch of antioxidants to offset that chemical exposure. Remember what I've said in so many slide presentations. Um, nothing is ever totally a bad thing. It's all about balance. Yeah, you could say, well, is consuming uh, mercury a bad thing? Well, yeah, that is a bad thing. That's a heavy metal toxicity. But truthfully, there's mercury, small teeny weeny amounts, in our soil, in our vegetables, in our water, etc. It's when we are out of balance, when we consume too much of it, when we're exposed to too much of something, when our body can't take care of something, that's where the imbalance comes in, and that's where we have dysfunction and disease. So it's all about balance. It's not so much about saying, oh, this is a bad guy, this is a good guy. Um, it's about saying, too much of this is a bad guy, too much of this um, is a bad guy that is normally a good guy. So taking too many antioxidants can actually be a bad thing for people. It's all about balance. So the first, um, the understanding that we have coenzymes and enzymes in our body that make different things. NADH and FADH are considered coenzymes that con that are that control the function of our pathways. It's all about metabolic pathways in order to make energy. So these are oxidizing agents and reducing agents. These are oxidants and antioxidants that donate electrons, that take electrons in order for things to move. It's all about motion. Life is motion. And these pathways have to be moving. When these pathways start to slow down because of rate-limiting factors, that's when disease starts to set in. That's when symptoms start to set in. So your body takes glucose from our foods and it has to get it into the cells, get it into the mitochondria in order for glycolysis to take place, in order for the Krebs cycle to take place, in order for oxidative phosphorylation to take place, in order for you to make ATP. I've said it before, that is one of your life goals. That's one of your life purposes. You don't have life purpose? Well, here's your life purpose, to make ATP. You have other life purposes that we'll talk about in this whole genetic series. But that is one of your life purposes to make ATP, whether you know it or not. So next time you're at a, uh, at a uh, self-development conference and they say, what is your life purpose? You raise your hand really high and say, my life purpose is to make ATP. And you will be the talk of the seminar, I'm sure. So the way we make ATP is getting ultimately glucose from the breakdown of carbohydrates, from the breakdown of fatty acids, into the mitochondria. So you need fatty acids and glucose in the mitochondria in order for you to make ATP. That's how you do it. So that goes through glycolysis. It goes through 
the Krebs cycle. These are limiting factors. These are oxidants and antioxidants, reducing agents, oxidation, oxidizing agents, in order for these pathways to take place. NADH, FADH is a part of this whole process, and they're all limited by different genes. Another picture of the citric acid cycle with a few things taken out. Whole purpose down here on the bottom right to make ATP. That's your life's purpose. So we look at your genes, and I understand this PEG gene is not yet in your profile, in the patient SNP profile, so, but it's in mine as I look at people, so I'm partly making some decisions based upon some things you can't see. But it's... Um, it's a very, this is a rate-limiting step. The PEG1234 gene are rate-limiting steps. They make pantothenic acid that pushes this pathway. It's all different piece of rate-limiting steps in this pathway. That's what we're talking about with these genes. The carnitine genes, the SLC genes, look at how many there are. And if your gene picture looks like this on your carnitine genes, you definitely have rate-limiting steps in the ability to get fatty acids into the mitochondria in order to make ATP. Another rate-limiting step. So if you can remember that little phrase, these genes in the whole energy pathway, if I have a lot of defects in any one of these little gene families, it's a rate-limiting step. Carnitine limits the ability to get fatty acids into the mitochondria for oxidative phosphorylation to take place, which is supposed to spit out a ton of ATP. So if I have a bunch of defects, and this person would fit into the a lot, um, then that is going to hinder my ability to make ATP. If I have more than this, you're going to have a lot of hindered ability to make ATP. So inside the cell, carnitine through the OCTN2 gene uh, or OCTN2 protein made by the SLC gene goes into the cell, affects this what's called the carnitine shuttle in the mitochondria, this is the wall of the mitochondria, to get fatty acids into the cell. If there is a Rate limiting step there, meaning that carnitine is not able to get fatty acids into the mitochondria very well. We can see on other tests. So I can see your genetic profile, like in the last slide, that you have a bunch of SLC gene defects. Oh, wow, is that really affecting me? Well, there's other tests that we could do that we can see. Are, am I producing more adipate? Am I producing more Ethylmalinate, am I producing more suberate? If I am, then this is a huge rate limiting step for me. So we use the, the, uh, a test called the organic acid test, which is another functional medicine test. In this case, this person, see how high their adipate is? They're not getting fatty acids into the mitochondria very well. They don't have high suberate, not high methylmalinate, but if any one of these three is high, then that carnitine shuttle is limited. So it can be limited by the genes. You have these SLC gene defects. It can be limited by other things. Let's say I have zero SLC gene defects. I haven't seen anybody that has zero, but let's pretend I have zero. But I could have a heavy metal toxicity that's blocking that carnitine shuttle. Follow me? So when we look at an organic acid test, we say high adipate, high suberate, high ethylmalinate. Then we go, hmm, this person is not getting fatty acids into the mitochondria. Maybe that's a big reason why they got a lot of fatigue and they have to take a nap driving home from work every day. So, or they have to rely on coffee in order to wake up in the morning. Okay. Or their muscles are sore all the time. Their back hurts all the time. They're going to have to go to get adjusted. They have to go to the massage therapist all the time. They're just sore all the time. Rate limiting steps. Got that? Rate limiting steps. That's what you have to look for if you're going to be a good doctor. Not, oh, here's a drug. Here, take this. Or here's a vitamin. Take this. Where's the blockage? Where's the, where's the brakes put on where it's not supposed to put on? Where's the rate limiting step? 
Okay, so we look at these genes and we see that. Does that make sense? Good, not really rocket science here, right? Another gene is the ACAT gene. ACAT gene, um, as I list here, might be one of the most important ones. It supports the conversion of fats and proteins into acetyl coenzyme A. Remember, acetyl coenzyme A is a huge rate limiting step because that's the first step of the citric acid or the Krebs cycle to spin out the spinning around, spinning out ATP. Your life purpose, right? ACAT defects significantly impact that Krebs cycle. So it's going to really limit mitochondrial function, meaning the function of producing ATP, and you can have influence all the way through your whole body with this. So super, super important. We see this gene defect a lot. This is, this is a very important gene defect. So especially with chronic fatigue, uh, chronic Lyme patients that are just wiped out and have no energy, can't get out of bed, look at the ACAT genes. Look at that. Supporting that is going to be super, super important. Okay, so now you know why I'm making specific recommendations on your supplement recommendation list that you're going to get. Okay, so now you're starting to under understand that, hopefully. Okay, other genes. These other genes in this whole energy function are taking fatty acids, taking uh, glucose, turning them into energy. We have to look at all these different genes. The NDUFS genes. Now, I know in your report you only have the NDUFS 7, I think, in the patient report, but there's actually eight different NDUFS genes that we look at. They all have to do with different, what are called complex 1, complex 2, uh, et cetera, of the mitochondrial function, how it's producing energy, how you're producing ATP. So we're looking at all those genes. Alpha-ketoglutarate, another rate-limiting step in the OGDH gene. So we're looking at all that and making some recommendations based upon that. With all this, please, please, please remember, I'm going to hound this on every slide presentation, I can only make res uh, recommendations based upon your genes. So you cannot call the office and say, well, he made this recommendation, but it says to take three a day. Can I take two a day? Uh, my, my receptionist is going to go, I don't know. Ask your doctor. I cannot be your doctor. I'm making recommendations based upon your genes. If you want me to be your doctor, then you have to become a full patient in our office. We need to start with a case review. And we mainly see cancer and really, really sick Lyme patients in our programs are not cheap. So I put this together to make it very cost effective for people to get a piece of our help and utilize maybe a piece that their doctor is missing for, uh, you know, for a fraction of the cost of becoming a patient in our office. But if you so desire to go the next step, you have to go to our website under this tab called First Steps. Can't be any easier. And I can make it any easier. Follow the steps. Call the office and say, I'd like to become a patient. How much does it cost? What's the cost of the initial case review? Um, it says right on there what you're going to get on the initial case review. So you're not going to get answers to your questions. That's when I get to interview you and see if I'm going to even accept you as a patient. So understand we're trying to give away as much information as possible. Download my books. Watch all my videos. Devour my website. Um, I can't. I can't do any more for that than that. You have to understand the agreements of the 23andMe agreements. You're going to get a video series. You're going to get your genetic SNP report, and you're going to get a supplement report that's completely uh, solely 100% based upon your genes and that little questionnaire you filled out. So it's not me being your full doctor. You have to. You have to understand that. Okay. I know you do. You're great. This is what the supplement report's going to look like. And if, honestly, it, it's just, you know, if do the best you can. If you can't afford all of them, pick some of them. If you start with them and they make you sick or something, you might have to slow down. Everybody's body's type is, is, 
is different. I have some patients that only can take a half of each pill a day to start with until their body is so backed up and so, you know, compromised that they have to start really, really slow. It's all about taking steps. It's not how fast you go, okay? It's about taking steps in the right direction. That's what this is about. Thank you very much. I hope this was enlightening for you. Bye-bye.